So thank you very much. Thank, thank you very much for having me. Um, it's the first time I'm in Poland. I've never been to Poland before. Uh, I've landed like a Tuesday evening and I was sitting uh, in a bar with a friend of mine. We had a few beers. And I was like uh, watching like the European qualifying games in soccer. I'm very into soccer. I like looking at it, not playing it basically. But uh, I'm very into soccer. So um, I opened up the life taker on my mobile phone, right? So we were drinking the beers and I had the mobile phone like laying next to me. And I always had to refresh like the life ticker because it was not updating, right? So I was sending a request to, to the server and saying, hey, please give me the latest data. What happened in the game? Did a goal happen or did a red card or a yellow card happen? And the server answered me and said, no, nothing happened basically so far. And uh, Germany was playing as well, so I'm from Germany. And uh, Germany was playing as well and I didn't catch up with that. So my life ticker wasn't shown there. So I was like sending a request again um, to the server telling me, hey, is something going on? And then, yeah, there was a goal happening. Right. So, um, but the server didn't tell me, and that was basically noth nothing what I would expect from a live ticker when it comes to sports, when it comes to live updates. Right. So what I would expect is that the server would like tell me, hey, I got something new. So if I get a request to the server, it would be nice if the server would say, hey, okay, I got something new. And if if something new uh, happens to the server, he would immediately tell me, like giving me the information right away. Right? So, so, hey, I've got, got something new without me having a request being sent to the server. And, and if something happens to the server, um, he would immediately tell me again, right? So, I want to be updated in several terms when it comes to the web, the web development from the server if there is something, something new in the server and it should get shipped to me, to the client, without having me to send a request. And with this use case, I'd like to welcome you to my talk, Real-Time Messaging with Angular on the one side and with ASP.NET Core SignalR on the other side. So today, in the next like 17 minutes, I have a countdown here, so I will be on time, hopefully. Um, uh, we will take a look at how we can, um, so what SignalR basically is, how we can bake it into our ASP.NET Core SignalR uh, web API, and how we can bake it into Angular, and how we can get real-time updates going, right? So first of all, before we start, before we dive into the code and uh, taking a look at code examples, I want just to clarify what SignalR basically is. So SignalR enriches your API with kind of a, it's not a protocol. I was asked in the backstage, hey, is it a protocol? No, it's not a protocol. It's like an umbrella technology for you, doing all the work for you when it comes to real-time data to enrich your ASP.NET Core. Web API. And if we talk about like updates to the client, the first thing which comes into your mind, or when you are the customer, the first thing which comes into their mind is like, uh, hey, let's do polling, right? Polling is like you just uh, ask the server periodically for data. So polling looks like this: you ask for data, ask for data, ask for data, ask for data, and nothing happens. You ask again. And again, again, and again, and then something happens, right? And then you get your data back, basically. So this, this basically is polling. But we do not want to do polling, right? We do not want to set the server under stress. This costs real money. In, in, in times of Azure Firebase and all that kind of stuff, this is money which is going on because the server has to be um, up and running. So SignalR does cover a lot of different technologies for you so that you as a developer do not have to think about what, uh, what is going on underneath. So SignalR goes from the client to the server and saying, hey, Dear server, would you like to do web sockets with me? And the server's like, mm, yeah, I, I, no, I, I can't really do that, right? So then there's a fallback to server send events. And the client says, oh, we can do server send events if you want to. And when the server says, no, I really can't do that as well, right? there's another fallback to long polling. The advantage of SignalR is that it handles that automatically for you. So you write the code one time, and all the negotiation phase runs behind the scenes. And that's a pretty cool thing. So, how do we do? How do we get all that things into our ASP.NET Core Web API? Are there any ASP.NET Core Web API developers here today? I see a few hands going. Hopefully, after this talk, uh, I will have, uh, you will be excited to do more ASP.NET Core. However, uh, you guys, if you guys have seen that, so basically, an ASP.NET Core Web API is nothing else than a console application nowadays. Right, 3.0 just got shipped. So um, we just have a public um, static void main method which calls like any builder and we're building a web server up. But the interesting part is like one of the last lines, we're doing a use startup and we're configuring our API with a startup file. 
right? And this startup file does the complete configuration for our particular project, for our particular web API. So there in this startup file, which is a, just like a normal class, right? We have a method which is called configure services. And we're getting past an iService collection interface. And on that service collection interface, we can register all the services we want to use inside our application, inside a web API. And the first thing you have to do is services.addSignalR. You don't have to install any package. It's built in, right? So you just do add signal R. And then there's another method um, which you get given from the scaffolding if you do .NET new web API with a .NET CLI. There's a configure method. And in this configure method, we have to enable signal R as well. So what you can do is you can use routing. And after that, you can say add use endpoints. And on this endpoints, we register an endpoint which is called slash to do hub, and we are mapping this endpoint, which is public, to the class to do hub. Right? So now, what is a hub? Right? So a hub is nothing else in ASP.NET Core than a class which derives from hub, and every method, in this case, my super duper action, can take any objects if you want to, so this can be typed. And these actions or these methods, my super duper action is publicly publicly invocable. So every JavaScript client can invoke this method. It's like an interface, right? So this hub is exposing those methods, and when it's get called, you're doing clients dot all send async. So you're broadcasting an event to all the clients which are connected, right? So this is a simple chat application. It could look like this. Right? So you're getting the method called, and then you're doing a broadcast, and you're broadcasting the event, which can be named like you want to, with a particular part of data. What you also can do is you can type that whole thing. It's generic. So you have hub, and you can pass an iChat client, and then you fulfill kind of an interface, kind of a contract, just to be type safe there. Right? What, what you, you also have is you have a context property where all the user informations are, like user identifier, the user, the connection ID, if the connection is aborted, and stuff like that. So this is pretty helpful. We even have events, so when somebody connects to your hub, you can throw an event and saying, hey, Fabian joined the chat, or Fabian left the chat, or something like that. But sometimes you don't want to go over a hub. Sometimes an update or a broadcast from an event should be like the side effect of maybe a post method or a delete method. Hey, I deleted something, or your colleague deleted something, or somebody is updating a document where you are working on right now. Right? So what you also can do is you can inject the complete uh, context into your controller and react or throw events when you're doing a get, post, put, delete, or whatever you do in your web APIs. So you can inject it via dependency injection in ASP.NET Core, and then when the post method um, comes into play, you just can say clients all send async, maybe to do added, and just pass the new to do entity which was added. And then the client can register in it and can do something with it. You can decide that. Right? So, so that's, that's the back end part. How do we get that whole thing now into the Angular part? Now things are getting interesting because the server provides this functionality now, but we have to register to it. Well, first of all, there's an NPM package which you can install, which is at Microsoft slash SignalR. It has been at ASP.NET SignalR before. This is the new name, right? So they renamed it again. Naming was not always the best thing about Microsoft, to be honest, right? So, so now they renamed it, right? right? You, you can, can download, download it under NPM. And if you have installed the package and uh, got it into your Angular application, you can import a hub connection builder from Microsoft slash SignalR. And on that hub connection builder, you can now pass the URL. And this is exactly the URL which we mapped in the startup class. Right? So, so this, this is the hub we are now connecting to. This is the connection. And th we are telling, uh, we are telling to the hub, hey, if something happens, please tell me. And we are building the connection, and then we are storing the connection in this hub connection property. New in the version 3.0 is that we have a built-in automatic reconnect. Right? So this automatic reconnect tries to reconnect you, I think um, the default is like four times, uh, immediately after one, five, and uh, something like 30 seconds. I have to look it up in the documentation. You can pass your own, like, your own logic to it when you want to reconnect and how often you want to reconnect. Right? And, and if, if we, we have that connection, we can, we can just um, um, subscribe to events. So if a to-do was added, um, if the event flies on the connection, I'm um, getting invoked, like the fat arrow function, getting past the data, and I can do something with it, right? 
And, and after I registered on these events, I just say hub connection dot start and the complete connection goes on. And you can see here, I don't care about web sockets underneath. I don't care what kind of method is running underneath. I'm just saying, please start the connection and then everything goes its way. You can even invoke the hub methods, like I said before, if you do hub connection dot invoke in the last line, my super duper action, and just pass some data to it. This is um, the invoke method which gets exposed by the hub connection. I would like to show a demo of that now. So let me just get out of my... Do you see something? Yes, you do. So, so far, Minko did not destroy my laptop. So it still works. However, this is my ASP.NET Core backend here. And you can see that I have a chat hub, which has a method, uh, method called send message. It's getting a chat message. And then I'm just broadcasting the event down to my connected clients. Inside my controller, which is just like a normal uh, REST controller, I'm injecting the hub context here, right? And then I'm just storing it in a private um, variable, and then I can do react to like when a post request comes in, I'm doing all my HTTP stuff, and then I'm also running a clients all send async. In this case, a food item was added, and I'm passing the new food item down to my clients. What I also do is I have a host service, which is like just sending random values out. So I'm doing a random value from one to from zero to 100, and the hub context clients all uh, send async new CPU value. Just imagine this could be like uh, engine values, temperature values from your machines or something like that, which are getting pushed into the server, right? So this web API is running here, and you can see that I'm pushing out the values here. It gets, it gets uh, locked so that I can see what's going on. So on the client side, however, I have installed the package and I have a signal R service here. And basically, it's like the same code you have just seen. I'm creating my hub connection. I'm storing it in a property. With the automatic connect, you can configure the logging, which I did, because then I can see in the console what is going on. And then I started the connection, and I'm registering on the events before. So you have to first register on the events and then start the connection. And here I'm doing nothing else than um, just uh, calling a next on a subject, and then I'm throwing out the events out of my service inside of my Angular application. So now let's take a look how this, uh, how this works. So you can see here the values are getting pushed. On the left-hand side, the CPU value is just like a, the random number we have just seen, right? So this is getting pushed inside your Angular application without refreshing. This is kind of cool. So in the middle, in the... Um, now in the food list here, I will just copy that over. You can see on this demo that I'm not a designer. So there you go. And the food list here, I can just add some food, save it, and you can see on the other side, it gets updated immediately, right? So you can keep your, your uh, clients in sync. Also, if I delete something, I can say it should get deleted. Okay, so that gets synchronized immediately. So this is a pretty cool thing. And here I have to take care. This is like the reaction of a, like a post request. So I'm sending a post request, and this was the broadcast we have just seen. And if I'm invoking a method from the hub from the client, you can see that here this is just a normal chat which I did. And uh, people can chat now. I can say, hello, Poland. Enter and it appears immediately on the other side, right? So this this is how the events are getting broadcast. I have another demo for you, which I would love to show because this is not the only um, use case for Signal. So this is a um, an application which is running in Azure, and I'm now taking my phone and I'm listening. This is pure JavaScript, so I'm listening to. Hopefully, this is going to work. Let me just update it. Yeah, it works. So my phone, so the device. How, how, I, how I hold my phone is now I'm using the public API from HTML and JavaScript. This is pure JavaScript. There's no Angular, React, or anything else inside of it. This is pure JavaScript. So I'm just using that thing with WebSockets just to, you can, maybe you can see it here, maybe the first row or something, so I can turn it. And this is pure JavaScript, right? So this was very interesting for me to do vanilla JavaScript, and you can like turn events or turn something inside your, your applications. This is kind of cool. So, let me close that. Hopefully, no, I think somebody else is on there. Because it's like sending press to wow, it's totally going crazy. You are, gotcha, gotcha. Thanks for breaking my demo. Perfectly. 
Well, well it, it kind, kind of, of works. works. <laughs> so let me just do it like that. To do the demo. So, so you have seen, right, right there are a lot of use cases, and you can even use like vanilla JavaScript for um, using single R. Um, it covers you when it comes to the fallback technologies, and you don't have to care about do I do web sockets or do I do any other technology which works for my specific scenario. Just think of streaming things, right? You can stream things and broadcast things from A to B, C, and so on and so forth. Just think of gaming. A nice demo would be like uh, doing the ping pong game with emotion inside of your phone. This would be a nice demo. Uh, I will try to implement that. What I want to say is that with SignalR, if you have fulfilled all the REST constraints, if you have the Richardson maturity model finished, you can take your API to the next level if you're enriched with the live updates and the client can either subscribe to it or even not. You can sync your data between all the clients, but if you, before you go away and want to implement that right now, I just want to give you, like, use it with caution, right? Be careful when using that. Why do I say that? Have you ever read like a newspaper and you switched for any, anybody just uh, stuck on your arm or something and then you just uh, lose the line where you're reading? That's the worst thing ever, is it? So um, sometimes it's better when you're like reading a newspaper article and you would update the site, uh, the site and the users are like losing their article which they're currently reading. This is not a good user experience, right? So sometimes it's better just to tell the users, hey, something new happened, please press F5 and then the user can decide wh whether he wants to see the news or not to see the news, right? So updating immediately always without asking is maybe not the right choice for the user experience. So my opinion, ASP.NET Core SignalR or Live Updates and Angular are really working better when they're used together. And I hope that in the end there's only one question open, naming who exactly is that guy standing in front of here. So my name is Fabian Guselbrink. I'm Google Developer Expert, Microsoft MVP, and Pluralsight author. I'm doing community out of my heart, and you can reach me under that Twitter handle. And hopefully we had a great time. Thank you very much.